afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Ryan Lozano from the Department of Language, Philosophy, and Culture here at San Antonio College. And this is the fourth annual special edition Halloween lecture. Uh, this year, philosophy goes back to hell. Uh, we went to hell two years ago when I talked about Dante's Inferno. Other lectures have included uh, lectures on the European witch trials, let us burn the witches to save them. Also, we've looked at uh, trickster mythology in, or trickster gods in world mythology, which I entitled Loki's siblings. But this year, we're going to take a look at uh, a philosophical history of the devil. Can anyone tell me what that image is from? Legend. Yes. Who has seen the abysmal 1980s Tom Cruise film Legend? Outstanding. The rest of you are remiss. Add it to your Netflix queue post haste. You will be better for having done so. I would like you to take just a minute, close your eyes, trust me, I'm a doctor, and picture the devil. See what you come up with. What do you got? What are some features? What can we expect? Red. Anything like those? Exactly like the top right. Especially like that middle one, I don't know. It's strange. Oh, got no. <laughs> Where do these ideas come from? So we've got the red. We've got the horns, we've got the tail, usually a pitchfork, maybe even the addition of wings. Oh, look at him. That's cute, isn't it? <laughs> How did these ideas get into our heads? When, we're th when we think of the devil, what exactly is it that we pick up on? What is it that we key into, and where do those ideas come from? We are all predominantly in a Western understanding of Satan. And so when we think about this, Regardless of our religious tradition or lack thereof, we are kind of the inheritors of this tradition of looking at this. We're going through about two millennia of Western theology, literature, uh, both big and little t tradition within the churches, and it's really kind of hard to avoid. Uh, the devil is always going to have certain characteristics when he's depicted. They're more or less the same. Let's take a look here. We've got Elizabeth Hurley and Bedazzled. We've got uh, Alan Cumming in Bob the Devil and God, Dan Castellaneta in Futurama, Trey Parker, one of the most familiar ones to us in South Park, Viggo Mortensen, pre-Lord uh, of the Rings in The Prophecy. If you haven't seen The Prophecy, you need to pick that one up too. Uh, Tim Curry as the Lord of Darkness in Legend. We've got Al Pacino in The Devil's Advocate, Harvey Stevens in Omen, and the, uh, the rest of the Damien movies. And we have uh, Rosalinda... Celetano in The Passion of the Christ as kind of that most recent sort of androgynous and doubly evil version of the devil. When we talk about the devil, we tend to refer to he or him. Why do we use these particular personal pronouns? Well, we have a tendency to anthropomorphize both the devil and God. So if we think of God, now we probably think of Morgan Freeman or we think of something along these type lines. But why do we do this? Well, there is Peter Stormar and Constantine. These reflect kind of the roles that we've imposed upon the devil. The devil, for the most part, is a cultural creation of ours coming out of this tradition. Uh, the Old Testament Satan is just an opponent or an obstacle and so very often appears actually as an angel of God. In this case, Satan is depicted doing God's bidding as he very often shows up in the Old Testament. Uh, in Greek, that becomes the adversary, or the slanderer, as it's sometimes uh, uh, interpreted, which was Latinized as diabolos, which has entered into diablo, and finally into the devil. Okay. That's where we get our modern word. And I'm going to use these kind of interchangeably. Uh, Satan, the devil, and so on and so forth. Now, it is pretty safe to say that as much has been written about the devil as has been written about God, possibly even more so, as a literary antagonist alone, he's probably surpassed God long since as kind of the ultimate foil to the godly protagonist or just the hero figure in literature. Uh, the largest uh, body of work is coming from about 500 years ago uh, and that, that period of time up until the 19th century. Over there we have William Blake's illustration of a scene from Paradise Lost in which the devil is descending upon the heavenly angel. This is an illustration, this one's somewhat more recent, of Goethe's Faust, where Mephistopheles, the particular iteration of the devil, is tempting Faust 
to find that truly unique experience for which he would sell his soul. Uh, perhaps the most famous literary expression of Satan shows up in Dante's Inferno, where Virgil has led Dante down through all the different levels of hell, and finally, in the very pit of hell, they encounter Lucifer. And Lucifer has three heads with three mouths, and he is forever chewing on, and here's a color illustration of that from a little bit later, Judas, the betrayer of Christ in the middle, Brutus, uh, over here, the betrayer of Et tu, Brute? Yes. And Cassius, one of Brutus's collaborators in uh, killing Caesar. Interestingly enough, if we fast forward to Soren Kierkegaard, we find Brutus cast now as a tragic hero and not as the ultimate betrayer. But the character of Lucifer more or less remains unchanged throughout all of these. Uh, in the largest medieval manuscript ever written, both literally and figuratively, <laughs> a book we call the Codex Gigas. Uh, it's a Latin term that implies just great big book is basically what it is. And it is indeed that. Uh, the book is about three and a half feet from top to bottom. Uh, the book weighs 165 pounds and has several hundred vellum pages comprising it. This is a nearly perfect, flawless copy of the Old and New Testament, but interestingly interspersed with that is a collection of metaphysical knowledge, folklore, folk remedies, and so on, and it's thought that this was either inspired by, devoted to, or perhaps even penned by Satan himself. Interestingly enough, paleographical research into this text has revealed that a single scribe did this. Now, writing in that medieval unsealed hand, it takes about 20 seconds per line. This book has over 500,000 lines. Now, realizing that the medieval monasteries day-to-day uh, -day would give you only about an hour or two to write, it's suspected that it took the author of this book between 20 and 25 years to write this. And the stories that grew up around it were that he was a monk in trouble, and he had sold his soul to Satan in order to get just a few more years of life. And so he told the abbot superior of his Benedictine monastery sometime around 1265 or so, so roughly contemporaneous with Dante, that he would write this Bible and all of human knowledge in a single night. Finding that he was unable to do so, he called upon Satan himself, and we have an illustration here of him, opposite an illustration of the city of heaven, uh, building off St. Augustine's De Civitate Dei, that uh, kind of counter, uh, counterplaces this. This is what we're avoiding, this is what we're seeking, but it's been kind of a controversial book because it does have those diabolical influences here. Let's take a look at that image that shows up in the Codex Gigas. So here we have kind of a proto version of what we've come to associate with the devil. We've got our two horns, we've got our scary looking face, kind of a scaly thing here. Uh, the feet aren't quite hooves yet at this point, but the claws are certainly there, a bifurcated tongue, like a serpent might be for instance. And very interestingly, the loincloth that he's wearing here is ermine. Whenever we see those pictures of the old kings and queens and they've got the white cloak on with the little black dots, those are all ermine skins, which in medieval heraldry was reserved, come on in, was reserved only for kings and queens of, uh, and royalty in general. And so this has kind of been looked at as, is Satan wearing this as what essentially is a diaper out of disparaging those kings and queens, or is this to show that they're lower on his respective totem pole and so on, but this image, 13th century image, is nothing new to the world. Uh, the Christians that, for our purposes, more or less invented the devil at this time, are taking, taking something ready at hand, the god Pan. A uh, very familiar theme in Greco-Roman mythology, we have the horns, we have the hooves, and so on. And these have transitioned nicely into what we now think of as the devil. Specifically, they transitioned into the form of Baphomet, uh, one of the many iterations of Satan himself. Whether it's uh, Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, Mephistopheles, as we saw in Faust, uh, Baphomet, and so on and so forth, where we've got those elements, plus the wings of the fallen angel, uh, the breasts of the nurturer, there are the hooves down there. Uh, this is the statue that's being proposed. I think it's Tulsa. 
Tulsa, Oklahoma, to go alongside the Ten Commandments as the, the Satanist monument. So we got the cute little kids looking up to old Baphomet there. This is an ancient, ancient image that has come full circle into modern times. We've taken mythology and we've co-opted it more for our own use. Okay. Now, in 1942, the poet W.H. Auden, right over there, is supposed to have asked a group of Sunday school children, do you know what the devil looks like? And he said, the devil looks like me. And he might have been right. In this sense, this is perhaps the best understanding of what we now have when we think of the devil or diabolical type influences. The devil as a metaphor is kind of our modern understanding of this. Uh, it's the confluence of social and political, biological, psychological, and philosophical notions all brought together in something that just to us represents a sort of evil idea, but it has a surprisingly ancient pedigree to it. This is back to that adversary of the pre-Christian Jews, all the way up through Pope Gregory Great's ancient enemy, as he refers to him. In the Western world, Satan almost exclusively is described as what he's not, and rather than what he is, almost always in negative terms. And we owe that particular legacy to St. Augustine, who's depicted here uh, conversing with one of the devils. St. Augustine described evil very much like physics describes cold. In physics, the further away you move from the source of heat, the colder something is going to become. In this case, the further we move away from the source of good, that is God, the more evil that we're liable to become. And so we have this almost negative understanding of what the devil is. Uh, if we update, and there's our physics reference, if we update this to the rather controversial journalism professor at UT, Robert Jensen, he describes the devil as the incarnation of vacuity. That is to say, the earthly pre presence of an infinite absence. And so kind of carrying forward Augustine. Uh, the poet Auden himself had said that the devil has no positive existence, but is just a recurrent state of fear, faithlessness, and hate. So again, we have the absence of things like confidence, faith, and love. All those things that we typically associate in the Western world with that ethical monotheistic God, be it of the Jews, of the Christians, of the Muslims, or what have you. What about the problem of evil? How do we explain that one? That's a biggie. That's our recurrent problem in the philosophy of religion. Why does this good God allow bad things to happen? For instance, why do we have hurricanes that destroy villages? Why do we have childhood leukemia? Why did Jersey Shore get six seasons and Firefly only had one? <laughs> Problems of evil. This isn't a problem, though, until ethical monotheism enters the picture. Evil is not problematic until you try and say that there's only one God and that that God is essentially good. Up until that point, you can blame it on, well, the bad gods did that. That was Hades, or maybe that was Loki or Anansi being tricky on something. As soon as we posit a good God, now we've got to say that that God has either created the evil himself, allows it to exist, or otherwise has just not gotten around to it quite yet, all of which are really problematical. And so... We've taken what is a remarkably Zoroastrian or bi-theistic or dualistic approach. We've given God a counterpart. We've given God a devil on which to blame some of the bad things. If we look back at the Old Testament, specifically the prophetic books, some of the earlier books that we find, uh, Job, which we know was an oral tradition long before it was written down. Here we have uh, another William Blake illustration of Satan pouring the plagues onto Job. The story, if you're not familiar with it, was Job was a very godly man, a very righteous and faithful man, and God and Satan are observing his behavior, and they're having a discussion between the two of them. And Satan says, let me test his faith. Let me see how much he really believes, and if he's really faithful to you. And God essentially says, go for it. Do your worst. Test him. Come on in, guys. Test him however you like. There's a particularly telling version in Isaiah, uh, chapter 45, verse 7. God says, I form the light and create darkness. Uh-oh. Is God now taking credit for the bad stuff, too? I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all of these things. Satan in the Old Testament 
is very often cast as an observant, obedient servant of God rather than an adversary. In fact, there's our uh, Greek word, diabolos, that adversary or opponent. In the Hebrew, and I've added here the, uh, uh, the diacritical marks to show us that there's a long A sound, this is Satan. Those three letters, as they're put together, just means adversary, and that's not the enemy of God in Job. That's the obedient angel that's sent to test the righteous Job. He's working for God. Uh, in Numbers, Satan is the angel who blocks the path of Balaam, a non-Israelite prophet, whose journey God has forbidden. And so again, we have this as the agent working for rather than the adversary of. In Chronicles, Satan, here actually named uh, and personified, is the one who inspires King David to evilly enact a census and count the Israelites. Uh, the book of Enoch, which is not part of the accepted canon, but has had a great deal of influence in our culture. Has anyone seen that movie, Noah, from last year? The giant rock monsters that help Noah build the ark and that fight off the evil Tubal Cain. Okay? That, that is a scriptural, but a non-canonical scriptural reference. Uh, in the book of Enoch, uh, the big inspiration for that movie, we have this notion of watcher angels. And the, the term for watcher in Hebrew is really, really close, just a couple of those little accent marks away from being fallen. Okay? Those watcher angels that have been bound hand and foot, cast into the darkness, ostensibly here to earth. Their leader, Azazel. That shows up in the movie. The name Azazel is one of those, along with Beelzebub, Mephistopheles, and so on, that we ascribe to the devil. Uh, we see that most currently in Islamic mythology, as Azazel shows up as one of the characters of Satan. Uh, a similar story, this one a little more familiar to us, was recorded of St. John of Patmos in about 90 AD or thereabouts. And we have a war in heaven in which St. Michael overcomes Lucifer, the light bringer, and casts him down. That didn't go as he hoped. Where does he cast him down to? It's not to hell. He gets sent here. If you remember the Kevin Smith movie from several years ago, Dogma, remember the ultimate punishment isn't hell, it's, where do they get sent? Earth. Earth. Yeah, specifically, wasn't it like Detroit or something? That, that would be punishment. Oh yeah, they're, they're sent to Wisconsin. That would be just about as bad. <laughs> now, this book comes down to us now as part of the accepted canon. In fact, the very last canonical book, Revelation. Satan is on earth, according to this. Now, when the creator gets cast as benevolent, and we've all of a sudden got a very good God, now evil is a problem, as I mentioned earlier. This is closer to the end of the Old Testament, as we're entering that uh, kind of Essene or prof uh, prophetic ap uh, apocalyptic age, right before the New Testament takes over, and they tend to emphasize that. It reaches its high point in Christ's confrontations with Satan that appears in the Gospels, uh, where he's tempted at various times either to give up the mission, to uh, more or less sell out God and his apostles, and so on and so forth. In Luke, uh, specifically in the 10th chapter, Jesus relates having seen Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Where does lightning strike? Again, on the earth. And thought of as a murderer from the beginning in John chapter 8. Paul calls the devil the God of this world, earth, in 2 Corinthians, and urges his readers to put on the whole armor of God against him in Ephesians. In 1 John, specifically in the third chapter, we're told that the whole purpose of Jesus' coming is to destroy the works of the devil. By the time we get to the earliest gospel of Mark, the first thing Jesus does following his baptism by John is resist the temptations of Satan in the wilderness. And I just love that. <laughs> So now we have Satan recast from the adversary to the servant to the tempter. And this is a theme that carries forward throughout the New Testament, and it carries in more or less to our own age. We find moral evils, mass murders and so on, and natural evils, hurricanes. Eventually Satan comes to be found in both. We sometimes think of the tempting of Eve uh, as a satanic influence, but if you read the text in Genesis carefully, Satan doesn't get mentioned at all. Uh, we find there that cunning serpent, in that case with a human head, uh, down here, 
uh, the serpent is kind of coiled around the back and around the feet. But it never says Satan. Over here, we've got a really weird idea of a serpent, kind of uh, the Gila monster, Komodo dragon sort of serpent, I suppose. But it's not until very much later, until the 14th century, when John Wycliffe, sometimes called the Morning Star, the very first guy to try and translate the Bible from the Vulgate into English, refers to the snake now as this satanic personification uh, in the form of the serpent. If we move forward in the West, we find Martin Luther thinking in a very Augustinian way in his commentary on Galatians. He tells us, Satan reigns over the whole world as his domain, fills the air with ignorance, contempt, hatred, and disobedience to God. In this devil's kingdom, we live. Being a creation of God, though, on an Augustinian account, Satan's actions, too, ultimately must always lead to good outcomes, either in this world or in the next. It's unsatisfyingly left there, because we don't really get any finality on this. Uh, in Milton, uh, the illustration on the right comes from William Blake's watercolor of Milton, we find Satan's evil as ultimately bringing this world into infinite goodness. And so he's pictured there with the orb of the kingdom and the scepter over which to rule. Rule where? Rule this earth. The devil was clearly a source of heresies, uh, inherent in the Protestant sects as far as the Roman Catholics were concerned, uh, right after the Protestant Reformations, and in league with the Pope as the head of the church. And so here's some modern uh, Protestant propaganda uh, tying the Romans to, uh, to ignoring the Bible, working in league with Satan, fulfilling revelation and apocalyptic prophecies and so on and so forth. And the Romans were just as quick to accuse Protestants of having diabolical purposes or motives in this. As we enter the Puritan era, era appropriate since we're coming up on Thanksgiving, uh, those wonderful ancient American traditions of eating turkey and killing natives, we find the Puritans uh, thinking of the devil as kind of God's hangman. Now historically, the hangman was the guy doing the job that nobody else wanted to do but nonetheless needed to be done got to execute these people, and so we find that guy that really kind of enjoys his work, and we allow him to do that, taking delight in the suffering that he causes, but ultimately still serving God's beneficence, taking out the trash, as it were. Satan's, Satan stays the enemy of God's purpose, but is still, this many thousands years later, acting as their agent. What about images of hell? This is the one that, culturally at least, is probably most familiar to us, uh, as inheritors of the Western, Western literary tradition, this is Dante's depiction of hell. And when we talk about the, uh, the several rings of hell, I think meetings are somewhere in here. Okay. Uh, traffic <laughs> falls down here a little ways. <laughs> Why isn't the devil ever shown suffering? The devil actually seems to be kind of enjoying himself in all the depictions that we see of hell. He's still the greatest sinner, still eternally damned, but this, again, gives us that idea of that hangman phenomenon. We have someone that enjoys their work that's being placed in that. We explain that by saying the damned continue to suffer, even in the afterlife, and who better to administer that suffering than Satan and company? Uh, the idea of contrapasso enters Dante, and this is the punishment aspect of hell. And, and Dante is where we see it best, or at least better than anywhere else, very similar to the idea of karma. What goes around comes around. Life's not a bitch till you're a bitch first. Okay. In Dante, we have the fortune tellers who claim to be able to see the future, and their heads have been turned backwards. So they have to, rock, they have to walk backwards everywhere they go because they can no longer see the future. We have the characters of Ugolino and Ruggieri forever gnawing on one another, struggling in death as they did in life, if we update this theme to uh, modern literature and cinema, we have the character of Viserys Targaryen in uh, George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones series, given the golden crown that he so badly wanted from Khal Drogo as he gets the molten gold poured over his head. Sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> but we find a bit of comfort in this idea of sinners getting what they hubristically think they've got coming to them, Especially if we look around and we see bad people seeming to enjoy living rather good lives. Uh, Bunyan, the guy who had written The Pilgrim's uh, Progress, relates the story of the life and death of Mr. Badman. I know, not a terribly original name for the guy. Where the eponymous anti-hero closes his eyes one moment 
and opens them in hell, not unlike the rich man in Luke uh, 16.22, where you live the good life and the idea of punishment is eventual, but not necessarily temporal. Another tradition has Satan being the embodiment of hell in and of himself. When Mephistopheles uh -oh, appears to Dr. Faustus in Christopher Marlowe's play, the first question Faustus has for him isn't one of shock or surprise, but how did you escape from hell? And Satan very casually replies to his inquiry, this is hell, nor am I out of it. A chilling, if plausible, thought, given this old problem of evil. Why is evil allowed to exist in the world? Because this is an inherently evil world. We are in hell even as we speak, if Marlowe is to be believed. And there's some compelling evidence to believe that that might be the case. Uh, by the time we update this to the 1940s, in Sars Qui Clo, that is to say, no exit, now it goes from being hell on earth to us who inhabit it. Hell is other people, something we can understand easily in the midst of rush hour traffic or while we're watching the evening news. Hell can even be a state of mind, or the mind itself. Uh, the best literary depiction of this, I think, is in Melville's depiction of the cursed Captain Ahab, bent on his revenge. Uh, here, let me read to you this phrase from Moby Dick. Ahab carried hell in himself from which forked flames and lightning shot up, and accursed fiends beckoned him to lead down among them. What better depiction of the hell that we're used to in the Western tradition than the one that Ahab brings to the readers of Melville? Ambrose Bierce would later, uh, in his Devil's Dictionary, which is a delightful read if you can get a copy of it, says each of us have our own secret and personal hell. We take our hell with us. Now we kind of look back at these past uh, eras, the classical and the medieval, and we view those beliefs as just being ignorant. If she weighs the same as a duck, she must be a witch. <laughs> Great reference to Monty Python. And we're inclined to dismiss it out of hand, but it's important to realize that like a great many of our own cultural assumptions, including the ones that we make today, he was simply another part of a perceived reality of their worldview. Any understanding of the pre-modern world is almost always going to be a religious one, just because of the way things were in those times. Uh, we simply view it as superstition, but they were viewed then and accepted as matters of fact, not as a superstitious leap. As early as the writings of Goethe and Shelley, Shelley actually writes a fairly lengthy and very good essay on the devil, we start to see a bit of amusement creeping into the writings. Uh, we start to see them viewed not necessarily as matters of fact, but we start to see little tinges of could this possibly be relegated to a superstition and should it rather be entered into the dustbins of failed theory than accepted as scientifically verifiable things. Today, we're most likely to take the position of Thomas Henry Huxley, his day's Wolverine, <laughs> when he describes our biology rather than our sins as the root explanation of our wickedness. When we find evil in the world, we ought no, not look to religious reasons, but how are we made? If we go back as far as Hobbes, we're inherently selfish creatures. We are self-interested all day long, and we look out for number one. How we fulfill those desires is a biological question, not necessarily a theological one. And the antidote prescribed by Huxley is uh, moral education an approach that further pushes the devil from matter-of-fact inclusion in our daily lives as a religious reality. With the early 20th century uh, producing a level of violence and genocide that had been previously unheard of, there was a momentary, but not lasting, resurgence of belief in the devil as the cause for all of this evil in the world. For the most part, our advances in psychology, as well as an increased separation and secularized world, have banished these notions as out of date or as ill-equipped to explain easily uh, evil as easily as we did in the past. Today, we find ideas of the devil based in religion to have largely become optional. Uh, a great many religious believers, even those that are very devoted in their faith, will look at the devil as, well, that's a cute mythology. It's handy to counterimpose against good and makes the good look even better. But that's about as far as it takes it. 
Movements like the Church of Satan in the 1960s, there's Marilyn Manson's membership card. He's number 100261 in case you were curious. This surprisingly doesn't worship Satan at all. The Church of Satan worships the self, something we also find in Nietzsche, in Ayn Rand, in L. Ron Hubbard as well as several others. This shows us that secularism at this point has kind of attained the ultimate irony in our culture. Satan has given his own church, but even there is not considered indispensable in Western belief. We've moved away from our creations, and we're back to where we started. The devil today is not something that haunts us in the middle of the night, drags us down to hell, and makes us perform evil deeds. The devil is cute. And there I leave you to ponder this history of the devil in our society. Happy to try and uh, answer any questions that you may have about this. Anything at all? Uh, there is just a fascinating body of literature that uh, that attends all of this. Uh, like I said, just as a as a key theme, the devil has enticed our imagination since the beginning of writing, and seeing that evolution through the literature is really one of the best ways to look at this. Christopher, did you have a question? Oh, I was just going to say I think it's really nice that you read. <coughs> Uh, textual evidence in the verse when you're talking about the Bible. Oh. I mean, most people don't. They just kind of reference. We see in you know Luke, and that's all they say. They don't say you know the chapter. Or oh sure. Whatever. So. Yeah. Specifically, and a lot of this falls into the category of I didn't know that was in the Bible. Yeah. You know, when we look at Numbers and we look at Job and we look at Isaiah, and we don't see the devil as we're used to him culturally being depicted. We see him as one of the boys helping out God. How are we to reconcile ourselves with that given the cultural picture that we're given? And that puts us in kind of an awkward position sometimes religiously. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, is it your sense that belief in a literal devil is uh, waning among uh, Christians, or, or is that not something that you come across? I think so. Um, uh, Given the resurgence of some of the, the evangelical movements and uh, the Pentecostal movements, it's, it sort of makes it difficult to gauge, I think, in some of those, and, and granted, I'm generalizing here, but in some of those, I think you're much more likely to see a very literal understanding of an actual devil at work. But I think generally within mainstream Christianity, uh, your average church-going Christian, I don't think, is really going to take the idea of the devil particularly seriously today. Unless you're a Supreme Court judge. Yes, unless you're a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, say something about um, the phenomenon we sometimes uh, encounter where we uh, try to insert something, in this case maybe the devil, to explain something else. So, for example, in, in the Bible, the number 666, for example, mm -hmm. refers to uh, seemingly Khazar Neuron uh, sure. uh, rather than the devil. It, get, it gets interpreted as the number of the beast so on. Yeah. Well, we, we have a natural, I, I think, on a species level, need to know. Otherwise, we wouldn't be philosophers. But we need that account for why these things are done. And so, in the older religions, specifically in those that are uh, mythological or polytheistic or especially pantheistic, animistic, and so on, we've got that very ready and very easy scapegoat to say, it's a good God or a bad God. Even as we update that, like I said, to Zoroastrianism, we've got Ahura Mazda and we've got Mithra over here causing trouble. Now it's difficult for us to do that, though. And in an increasingly secularized culture, we don't really look for a supernatural explanation. We look for that scientific explanation. If we've got a monstrous birth or something odd happening, we're not going to go to church. We're going to go to the scientists. We're going to go to the doctors and look for explanations there. But I think there's always going to be that inclination to try and explain things on that supernatural level just because we're kind of hardwired that way. Uh, if we look at atheism, that's sort of a next step level of thinking because basically we're sort of naturally inclined to look for a higher being or a supreme being. Does that kind of help at all? Does that, and in terms of the, the numerology, yeah. I mean, 
we could do a whole lecture just on the, the numbers and significance yeah. in the Bible there. Because clearly Caesar Nero, uh, Nero Caesar Nero, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Greek translates into 666. Yeah. So it's a reference to an actual person, yet we interpret that as... Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that, that has overlaps with the identifying with the Caesars, kind of like we identify the, the whore of Babylon as she appears. She, you know, again, that anthropomorphism uh, in Revelation and so on, is we like to attach it to things that are familiar to us. And I think having that, that set reference point is almost a, it's a security blanket for us more than anything else, I think, rather than something to be taken literally. Other questions? Well, yes, sir. I'm just curious about the role of uh, Satan or the devil in Islam, because I don't know a lot about it. You know, when, it, when Muhammad first, does he mention them? Uh, very little. Specifically, or yeah. Uh, very little, and it, it shows up not so much in Quranic belief, mm -hmm. but as, as sort of, um, particularly within Sufism, within the mysticism that's sort of uh, risen out of that. And again, that focus is, there is some mention of, of shaitan and of Satan, that's the uh, the Arabic that we saw. This is an adaptation of the Hebrew term. So they're they're both Semitic terms that mean essentially the same thing. They've got that idea of the adversary or the opponent, mm -hmm. um, but it's not quite the same sense as as say your modern Christian perspective of this ultimate evil. It's it's more of a, an antagonistic presence, and it gets personified in the character of that as Zazel, uh, which is one of the names that is given to uh, the fallen watcher angels, one of the names that's ascribed to Satan now, and that's sort of that confluence of all the Western mythologies pushed together, and is also a place, there's actually a Mount Azazel that you can go to that's associated, kind of like Sinai is associated with holiness, mm -hmm. this is associated with a place of evil. Huh. Uh, sort of a a connection of maybe a Golgotha type idea. That there's this mount that has all of the focus. So. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming. Uh, please eat copious amounts of chocolate so I don't have to take it back to my office. And uh, I've been delighted having you all here.